Okay, thanks uh, for allowing me to talk today. Uh, I also have wanted to thank the program chairs uh, for allowing such a session to be had. It is quite interesting. Um, it's a very crucial conversation, and I have probably the easiest talk of the day. So these are my disclosures. Uh, I wanted to open up. Um, as you know, here in the United States, we certainly have a drug problem. The drug problem is opiates, so uh, we're going to have a more comprehensive talk a little bit later today. But as you can see, the opiates and the epidemic that's uh, gripping our nation is really something that we were a very big part of. Um, with Joint Commission you and the push for us as practitioners really recognizing and managing pain, looking at it as the fifth vital sign, you can see here that with that shift in philosophy and also with our uh, push for addressing this issue, there was an incredible surge of opiate-related deaths um, while this was being practiced. And you can see a big surge just in the recent past, uh, largely with the more availability of uh, synthetic types of opiates. Now, uh, one good thing is hope is on the way. We actually have taken a look at uh, the CDC's patterns based on medical cannabis laws and opiate-related deaths. And you can see here the first study took a look at the time period between 1999 and 2010, where we had um, predominant uh, medical cannabis laws in a few states, and they took a look at the opiate-related deaths, uh, comparing states that did have laws with those that didn't. And there was a very durable uh, decrease in the annual opiate overdose rates. This actually strengthened over time. This study was published in JAMA in nine, uh, 2014. And with the Affordable Care Act, you can see that uh, the prescription rates are now more closely followed. Uh, uh, groups looked at Medicare Part D as well as the Medicaid population, and they saw a, um, a correlation between a decrease in opiate prescriptions, the prescribing practices, as well as the filling of these prescriptions in states that had medical cannabis laws. And you can see here that it was a more durable and um, strengthened effect if the state not only had the medical cannabis law on the books, but if they had an active dispensary system in place. So essentially, uh, if patients had access to uh, medical cannabis, you saw a reasonable decrease in the opiate prescription rates as well as the opiate-related deaths. Also important is the um, decline in the opiate prescription rates in states where you also had adult recreational use. Obviously, this is something that is uh, very recent, and they're going to continue to follow this. Uh, very notable, too, is that they took a look at the Medicaid population, where this is a population that is at higher risk for opiate uh, misuse and abuse. So why does this happen? Just a basic summary about the way cannabinoids work. Uh, I'm focusing on THC, but obviously there are other uh, uh, factors, that, other types of cannabinoids. THC is the, the one that's most talked about and the most prominent. Uh, but there's also CBD. Uh, it, essentially what happens is THC is an inhibitor to uh, GABA, which is also an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So what ends up happening is we actually do have these receptors uh, in the human body, these uh, cannabinoid receptors. So we have, similar to um, the body having its own uh, endorphins, we also have our own endocannabinoids. Uh, so THC is, uh, is a phytocannabinoid, uh, which comes from the plant. It binds to these receptors that uh, uh, actually inhibit the re release of GABA and allowing for increased dopamine. And we do know that um, the more dopamine is released, we have increased reward, and that's basically how it helps to uh, uh, potentiate the effects and also potentially reduce the effects of the opiates in the system. Uh, these cannabinoid receptors are two pr predominant ones, the CB1 and CB2. They're actually ubiquitous within the body. Uh, CB1 receptors are predominantly in the central nervous system, and the CB2 receptors are uh, predominantly in the immune system. 
So taking a look at reviews for uh, cannabis and pain management, uh, there are a number of reviews that looked at ra uh, randomized controlled trials, and their bottom line is that there is a statistic reduction, statistical reduction in pain. But more importantly is that not only is there some reduction in pain, but the cannabinoids, um, the cannabis that's used, is relatively safe and well-tolerated. Even more important is that we don't have toxic overdose, uh, mainly because there aren't any re uh, cannabinoid receptors in the, um, the brainstem, and so there's no overdose from respiratory depression. So more importantly, uh, even though there is some addictive risk with uh, cannabis, it's very low compared to things that are, we know are very addictive, like nicotine, alcohol, and other opiates. So essentially, it's relatively safe. Uh, you um, have no lethal overdoses, and you can see here that the annual deaths related to cannabis is nil compared to even things like peanuts and aspirin. Uh, there are some medically indicated uses uh, that are FDA approved for medical cannabis, and then there's also a whole slew of um, indications that uh, people purport uh, that cannabis can be this miracle drug, but just keep in mind that we do not have uh, evidence, uh, robust evidence that tells us the things on the right are you know, things that we can use cannabis for. Uh, we have very strong evidence that suggests that uh, medical cannabis can be used as an alternative or adjunct to pharmacotherapies that we know for um, the issues on the right. So why is this a big discrepancy? Well, mainly because we actually don't have enough clinical evidence. Obviously, the plant is very complex. Um, there are innumerable uh, active ingredients in the plant that we very know very little about. We know about THC and CBD. Uh, THC is the psychoactive component, and CBD is the more anti-inflammatory type of uh, component. Um, and just like what uh, Dan Jones talked about in his lecture this morning, the plant itself acts like a it's a team type of plant. Uh, you actually can't isolate a marquee player and have it just be that isolated uh, uh, active ingredient, which is why a lot of the synthesized uh, cannabinoids don't work as well as when your patients say that they're taking in the, home, the whole plant either by... Um, uh, uh, smoking it or consuming it. Uh, so that's what's uh, being discussed as the entire uh, entourage effect. Another major issue is that we really don't have a lot of robust studies, mainly because we're limited by its Schedule One status as well as the availability of uh, products to test. The, um, the marijuana that is available for research purposes really comes from only one source, so you don't have the wide variety and the cultivars that are available in terms of the engineered ratios between THC and CBD that people are describing as um, uh, its major medicinal effects. There are some practical considerations, like obviously there are uh, indications like nausea, vomiting, related to wasting illness and cancer chemotherapy. You really want to have the patients uh, try first and second line pharmacotherapies first, and then a more conservative approach is really trying the endocannabinoids, or actually the cannabinoids that are available for um, for use. And then obviously some things like they shouldn't have a substance abuse or psychotic disorder. And just for legal purposes, it really should reside in a state that has a medical cannabis law. So essentially, unlike Nancy Reagan, to just say no, I want to say we should just say no, like just be in the know about what we can and cannot use cannabis for. And also keep in mind that this is something that is not going to go away. The strong majority actually favors legalization. We reached a tipping point um, in around 2012, 2013. Now 61% of Americans say cannabis should be legal. Obviously, this is being driven by millennials, the Gen Xers, and even the baby boomers. Another important consideration is now 51% of Republicans favor legalization. Um, so it is coming to your state. Uh, essentially, 29 states now have some type of medical cannabis law in the books. Nine states have legal uh, use for adult recreational use. And in 2018, we're going to have even more states uh, taking a look at uh, rec recreational adult use and will be on the ballots. Uh, so you can see here there's a whole slew of states that coming this November. Um, the laws may change and these numbers um, may go up.
important things to note for medical marijuana use is that it's already been trending. In 2016, we had very, uh, very red and conservative states like um, Arkansas, North Dakota, and Florida uh, pass medical marijuana laws. So also keep in mind that your patients are definitely using cannabis. At least 12% of Americans have used it in the last year. Um, almost half of all Americans over 26 years old have used it in their lifetime. And we're also, um, the face of marijuana is changing. I don't know if you saw in the recent news, um, uh, the former House Speaker John Boehner is now uh, a, on the board for a top cannabis corporation in Ohio. Uh, and also the increasing demographic is actually the individual that's greater than 50 years old. So this is an opener for this uh, very interesting morning. Um, we have more talks coming along the way. The bottom line is to just basically understand that there are some uses for medical cannabis and it's not the miracle drug until we have more evidence.